Well, we got a lot to talk about tonight. Ted Nisi is in here with some terrific analysis. Then we got to figure out what this tax plan means for us. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. I'm still trying to figure out how I fare in this tax plan. And listen, that's what we all do. We all have our own self-interest first, right? We try to do the mechanics of the formula and everything else. We've got a, a, a smart, smart expert to try to at least give us some groundwork on how to get into that coming up here tonight. Glad to have you in. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in to what will be uh, almost our last original broadcast for 2017. I'm going to get right into some things, though. Uh, Ted Nisi, who's always doing some breaking work out there, uh, has been doing some math work of a different kind. Take a look at this headline. Uh, these two guys were thinking they might have to fight each other a little sooner than later. It looks like it's going to be a little later than sooner. Uh, but David Cicilline and Jim Langevin do a whew, by the skin of their teeth, right, on a census moment. count to make sure that we still have two districts. Welcome in. Merry Christmas. Hey, good, good to, to see, see you. you. Congratulations Merry on Christmas. your nuptials. Thank you. Thank you. Still married. You're two a veteran. In. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You guys still get along? Yeah, it seems to be going all right. Yeah. Keep them busy. So. How many times has somebody said, when you're having the babies? Yeah, so that is, that is common. <laughs> now it's happened on television. Thanks, Dan. My, uh, well, my what's the answer? My there, grandmother right? will see this and ask. You know, he had a good question. Somebody needs to get that yeah, answer exactly, from him, I hear. Exactly. I think um, my wife would want to say that. So. Yes. Um, <laughs> We uh, we're this close to being a one congressional district state, aren't 157 we? 157 residents right now. Yeah, is the difference between us having one U.S. House seat and two U.S. House seats. Um, the way this works, just to remind people, is we in 2020 there'll be one of the 10-year censuses, the full counts. They'll go out. Um, maybe it's Sensei. Maybe I said that wrong, but they go out and count everybody. And those official numbers, they'll then redivide the 435 seats in the U.S. House based on where the population is and these are estimates based on what the new population numbers show about where it's going and Rhode Island you know is perilously close at this point if these numbers are accurate uh, when they do the final count to having the 2022 election be the first time ever you know since George Washington that we wouldn't send at least two people from Rhode Island uh, to the US House what do we have to do well, a couple things. I mean, first of all, you know, I admit that uh, I get plenty of Facebook and Twitter commenters who are like, great, because they aren't fans of the incumbents. So they're like, good, one less of them. Uh, but it does have an effect. That's so stupid. <laughs> get a lot of that on social media. Stupidity? Like, great. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I'm no, not, you do. I, well, I'll Why just, would you want one less representative? Because the they don't like Island. how they vote. They don't like, they'd rather have, you know, parts of the country they th people think are making the right decisions and who they choose, choose than, than their own neighbors who they disagree with. Um, but it has other ramifications. I'm not a total expert myself, but I believe it has ramifications on how money is divided up in some places. Um, and as you say, just in terms of the number of people who can call a, Congress a federal office and try to you know, push something through that you need or whatnot. You have, right. you're, you're two and you're one instead so, of two. So we have to, we have to hold on by the skin of our teeth population-wise. We yeah. can't lose any more people. Can't lose any more people. And it's also, you know, it's the other states, of course, aren't standing still, which is what makes this complicated. As the states that are growing, primarily in the south and west, uh, grow each year, even if Rhode Island, Rhode Island's actually grown six years in a row, a little bit, not a ton of people, like 7,000 people, but it's not losing population, uh, like some places, uh, like Illinois. But um, it's, it's not growing fast, and those places are growing faster. And so each time we grow a little and they grow a lot, we get closer. Well, the math has always been just on average, you know, 600,000 mm -hmm. people per, per congressional district. Obviously, when we're at a million and change, mm -hmm. we're under that mm -hmm. ratio. But what's weird is if you just lose another handful of people and we end up with one district, now you've got a million people for one congressional As district, and that is really uncomfortable. Yeah, one of the national political reporters pointed that out uh, and said, you know, all of a sudden, you know, right now Rhode Island actually is the two smallest congressional districts. If you think about the math, you know, we get about half a million people represented by each one. Suddenly, we'd have a million people represented by one person, and you know, you you suddenly we're the least represented in the sense of you know the power of each person's vote compared to the number of congressmen they have. So, um, you know, there's there is a story. Uh, I don't. I wasn't a reporter at the time, but I've always heard that in 2000, Massachusetts was very worried. Maybe you remember this, right. about losing a seat. Yeah. And Secretary of State Bill Galvin and some other folks you know, beat the band to make sure that census count counted every darn person, you know, every student apartment in Boston with six people, not four, that was illegal. So that we don't care, we're writing you down. To, and they actually kept a seat for another 10 years. The, uh, the potential conflict, if it goes the other way, uh, between Jim Langevin and David Cicilline would be 
high political drama. Oh, big time. I mean, if Neither two, one of them would be apt to want to give up the seat. I don't think so. I mean, Jim Langevin did sort of vaguely float the idea of a, a governor run um, in 2022 when, you know, whether Gina Raimondo wins or loses, that'll be an open seat uh, that year in 2022. Um, so it is possible one of them finds a different path out, you know, and Langevin will have been in Congress at that point for 20 years. You know, they always have to decide how long yeah, they want to stay. Yeah, that'd be a tough one. He's mm. beloved, politics aside, ideology aside, he's beloved and he's a walking uh, picture of courage. I he, mean, I have so much yeah. respect for what he has to do every day to, to get himself mm -hmm. going. Absolutely. But yeah. I do believe that running the state, people have a different... Uh, the, he, it, that might be a tough sell for him. Potentially, though, FDR won World War II, right? Mm. So, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But either way, it will be very interesting if we go down to one. Because don't forget, too, it is at that point an open seat. Mm. You know, do they clear the decks? Do the other Democrats clear the field and let those two fight it out if that's how it goes? Yeah. Or do people jump in who say, you know what? Like, this is a new day. These aren't incumbents for this seat. We're all running. Talk to me about uh, Pawtucket. You've been following this as well as anybody. Here's a headline from today. The Senate president's a little standoffish on the idea of Plan B from the Pawtucket mayor, uh, who uh, had a press conference earlier this week, was here a couple of nights ago explaining that, look, if the state's going to be this hedgy, if the House Speaker's going to be this frady caddy, what we'll do is we'll just take on the, the revenue from the stadium and borrow ourselves. But the most important piece of it for the Pawtucket is, is the catalyst for the development that's going to happen around that, right, around the stadium. It hasn't happened around the existing stadium because of the limitations, and that's what's all we explore. So this is what it's about. It's that new revenue. It would be a new revenue stream for us. We'd get all the state revenue, but also the development. Uh, to be honest with you, if you look at the numbers, it might be easily, more readily easily financeable for Pawtucket to do it this way because they have less risk in their first $15 million dollar piece that's in the in the Senate lingering proposal right now. Um, what's your 36,000 foot thought on the whole politics of this thing? I mean, it's hard, you know, as a reporter who's not up in Worcester and not super sourced in Massachusetts like I am down here, to know exactly what to make of the talks in Worcester. But if the Worcester talks are real and uh, Worcester in, with the state of Massachusetts has a competitive offer to put on the table, um, I would have to think at this point the Paw Sox would take that very seriously. You know, I mean, there's just there's just no oh, there's no doubt they are. sign there's no doubt that, that they're uh, what do you think about this, this? thing's going to move in Massachusetts in Rhode what? Island? Tell me that again. I don't see any sign right now this thing's going to move in Rhode Island. And as you said, I mean, in the end, it, it's up to Speaker Mattiello. Well, if Mattiello. it's not going to move, if it's just not going to move, period, they're gone. Yep. They can't stay in McCoy. Right. I mean, I presume unless you they're know they're not playing I, at North Kingstown uh, High School. Uh, Devil I mean, advocate, you know, you know uh, if they get a if they don't like the numbers in Massachusetts either, you know, maybe the team is stuck. You know, the team said they'd leave. You know, one problem is the team was pretty emphatic they would leave if they didn't get the Providence deal in 2015. So people also wonder if there's a bluff calling happening. Yeah, but here. you and I remember that that was a lot of. Uh, I'll do respect uh, to the passing of Jim Skeffington, it, it, there was a lot of bluster that there was, was going on. There, oh, absolutely. This one is a whole lot more. But yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's striking, and I think the, uh, you know, I think the, the politicians, especially in the House, are, really seem very petrified of the, the vote. Um, Speaker Mattiello. Do you really think this is a liability in 2018? With everything that's going to be going on, you think people are going to have a retribution vote any votes over, over building a any stadium? any worries about in an election year. You know that as well as I do. And, uh, you know, they're looking, they're coming up on a year. You know, Governor Raimondo uh, won't necessarily have strong coattails for Democrats in the legislature uh, with where her numbers are. They're nervous. And the speaker, you always have to remember, the speaker, as you know, represents a very conservative district. You know, it maybe, yeah, maybe Gordon Fox you know, putting aside how it is, his career ended, maybe a different speaker does this deal. You know, maybe if Pawtucket had uh, more powerful lawmakers in the House, as they did back when the last McCoy deal happened, mm. and they had the speakership. Mm. But right now, they don't have uh, anyone pushing it hard in the House uh, in a way that's going to get it across the finish line. All right, we're out of time here, but uh, read Ted's latest on how we're a lot of Catholics, but may not, maybe not. Give me 10 seconds. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're always the most Catholic, Catholic state, but, Catholic. but our, we as a state are like a county in other places, so there are other places that may be much more Catholic, especially in the South and West. It's kind of interesting how that's changing. Yeah. Good Christmas read for you. <laughs> Merry to you. Happy New Year, buddy. Merry Christmas, sir. All right, let's figure out this tax plan. In like 10 minutes, we'll get the whole thing figured out for you. Stay with us.
All right, so here's the deal. I didn't want to run up a bill with my CPA asking questions about how this tax bill was going to hit me, so I pulled one into the show. Hey, there's no grass growing under our feet. Headline, of course, yesterday was this incredibly historic day. Just ask all the uh, uh, the president's men, all those sycophants that uh, did nothing but, uh, my God, that was disgraceful. I don't care what you think about the numbers. That was a disgraceful display of adulthood, never mind uh, the politics of the numbers. But that's my opinion. Uh, here's uh, just a review as to how you could actually try to figure out how you are impacted. The $1.5 trillion tax cut makes major changes to current laws. First off, most Americans will pay a lower tax rate. The vast majority of Americans will see a tax cut in the near term. CBS News business analyst Jill Schlesinger says a big reason why is because the new law nearly doubles the standard deduction. As a result, there are going to be more people who are going to be able to claim that standard deduction. But returns can vary widely because of several factors like where you live and how many children you have. H&R Block says a married couple with two children in San Diego making $150,000 a year will save almost $3,600. That's because their tax bracket drops from 25% to 22. They'll also take the $24,000 standard deduction since it's more than itemizing mortgage interest, charitable contributions, and taxes. They'll also take advantage of the child tax credit doubling from $1,000 to $2,000. A single parent with two kids renting in Kansas City, Missouri would save $1,800 thanks to the higher standard deduction and child credit. But a single homeowner in Queens, New York will only get $100 more. That's because the $15,000 in state, local and property taxes he used to deduct is now capped at $10,000 under the new plan. And while most Americans will get money back, many of these tax breaks will expire. Many of the people who see benefits right now, they will actually be gone after 2025. Experts say millions of Americans will then end up paying more in tax than they are right now. So uh, Bill Moore is from uh, Bloom Shapiro, and I'm guessing, welcome, uh, Merry Christmas, Thanks Happy New Year. Us. So you're, uh, uh, let me ask you this, uh, you're going to be pretty busy. Yes, very busy. Full yeah. started uh, ringing a few months ago. Wasn't the original plan, did I miss something? Wasn't the original plan to simplify the tax code and to put guys like you out of business? Yes, it was, and I spoke about that a couple of times, and I thought I might need a new career because 90% of Americans weren't going to need our services. And I'll, I'll say I'm very excited about the plan. It's going to give us a lot of opportunities. The holidays are a lot of fun, but the phone's been ringing off the hook, which is great news. All right, well, I don't, I'm not sure what to do with that answer. That's about, is, is that answer about your own business model or about the country's uh, benefit here? Yeah, I think the plan is going to help us and I think it's going to help, us help CPAs. It's going to help keep us busy. I don't think America, listen, we need uh, guys like you. I need guys like you. A lot of us need to, everybody needs someone to take a look at their numbers. But reportedly America's disposition was not was not about supporting the certified public account, accountant industry mm -hmm. and, and, and the lawyers and the tax attorneys and everything else that goes on with this whole thing. Um, so let's just confirm you're going to be busier, not less busy. Yeah, absolutely. That wasn't the original sell. So let's, that's not your fault. That's government. Um, what's going to make you more busy about this plan? Sure. So to give you an example, one of the talked about points that was on the video earlier is they're getting rid of the state and local tax deduction. That's extremely important. We have taxpayers that might have a $100,000 liability come April. If we can get them to make that payment prior to year end, i.e. in the next 10 days, they're going to benefit from that deduction. If in the prior year, you'd normally just pay that in April, and then you'd be able to deduct that next year, that's going away. So the opportunity in the next 10 days is to make sure that we have all of our clients have an estimate of what their tax liability will be in these states come April and pay that in the next 10 days. Oh. <laughs> oh. I got to make, oh, well, I got to make a phone call. How come I haven't had a phone call yet? You're calling all, <laughs> like, maybe I ought to be with you. Uh, <laughs> Meaning what? 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 Frame for me what what the option would be to 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 do what? Pay ahead local property taxes, or to pay ahead 
sure. your own in, your state income tax or what? So you mentioned two things there, and there may be an opportunity for the first one. It's not very clear. Give your CPA a call on the real estate taxes. You may be able to prepay something for 2018. But what is clear is any 2017 state tax liability, whether it be Rhode Island, Massachusetts, if we can quantify what that may be, and we pay that in, or we have our clients pay that in prior to year end, they're going to be able to deduct that payment on this year's federal tax return. That's being eliminated effective 1 1 2018. So if you make that payment come April. So it's the payment, not the year attributed to the payment? Correct. You're a cash basis taxpayer. So if that payment's made by December 31st, they can deduct it on this year's return. If it's made after year end, it's gone. Subject to there's a $10,000 carve out that was mentioned. $10,000 being you can well, the, the thing about Rhode going Island, forward. The thing about Rhode Island and Mass, I, I, we've, we're not necessarily mentioned in that, you know, flame out New Jersey, New York, California equation that's gotten so much attention. But we've got a lot of property taxes that are here and we've got income taxes that are here and there are a lot of people watching this show who when they combine both of those uh, potential deductions are way over the $10,000 mark. Correct. So they're going to lose that shimmy and that twelve to twenty four thousand dollars standard deduction may or may not help that and recover that right? that's correct yeah you're right massachusetts is carved out a lot of times from the conversation but real estate taxes are very high it wouldn't be atypical to have clients with five times the amount of the ten thousand dollar deduction so for those taxpayers most of what you're hearing is the rate changes and most of those are going down whether it be the corporate rate from thirty uh, five percent to twenty one percent or the individual top rate from thirty nine point six to thirty seven percent this is an increase of tax in the tax that you're going to pay by eliminating the amount of deductions you can claim All right when we come back what's missing uh, in, in the calculus here and the coverage we'll find out too All right, there's one of the guys that thinks he's just created a miracle here. Uh, I don't know. We'll see what the public sentiment is going to be regarding the Republican tax cut. And that's how you actually refer to it. That's the Republican tax cut. The president would tell you it's the biggest one in, in the history of the man, of, of, of the world. He's wrong. This is not the biggest tax cut in history. Um, since Ronald Reagan, it is. It might be the largest reform. It's not the biggest tax cut. Um, whatever. Details, right? Uh, I, so this is some really good advice that we're getting from Bill here, which is if you haven't talked to your advisor, hurry up and do that be before the end of the year because depending on your assets, uh, your cash flow, whether you're uh, a W-2 or a, if you're, if you're a pass-through earner, meaning if you have an LLC or a sub-S corporation type and that's your primary source of income, you have some pretty interesting decisions to make in the next 10 days, right? Yes, absolutely. The, the biggest decision, again, is the state taxes. If you can prepay that state tax benefit, that state tax deduction is going to be attributable to the year where you make the payment. Talk to me about this thing, which is, the, well, I think one of the most difficult things for people to, to, to articulate, other than you guys who are so smart, and that is the alternative minimum tax. Sure. It's been in place a long time. Even people who pay it don't really understand it. Sure. Explain it and what's happened with this tax plan. Absolutely. You're laughing because most people don't get it, <laughs> Most right? people don't. They're like, D you explain it, and then we still go, duh, it, right? It's, it's a hard one to understand, and the, the big push behind it was the plan was to eliminate it for both personal individuals and corporations. And when the final bill came out, corporate was repealed, meaning there's going to be no alternative minimum tax. On the individual side, they have increased the exemption amount. Okay, so they've, inc they've tried to decrease who's going to be subject to the alternative minimum tax. My biggest takeaway from it is the biggest deduction that gets added back for alternative minimum tax purposes is the state tax deduction. And guess what? That's already going to be capped. So I was thinking through it more as who is actually going to be subject to this anymore versus, you know, it's, it's being repealed at the individual state. What, what income earners are, are <laughs> susceptible to the alternative minimum tax? That's interesting. I get that question a lot. And the answer is there's no defined maximum or minimum of income. Where I've seen it more frequently is normally the $300,000 to $600,000 range. Because when you add back those state taxes, they're very beneficial. And as you see, that's one of the main drawbacks to the new plan. Beneficial as deductions. Very beneficial Thus, 
for the deductions. Thus decreasing your tax liability. Correct. And if your tax liability goes down to a certain level, then the alternative minimum tax comes in to accelerate what you owe to the government, correct? Correct. Correct. It was, a, it was put in place to make sure you paid one or the other. So a lot of... Whatever's higher is the one you pay. Correct. The one that's higher. So when you add back real estate taxes and state taxes, that's when you can get some of these $300,000 to $600,000 So what's happened with this reform? What, what, what's the play here with the alternative minimum tax? In my mind, and again, this isn't uh, proven out yet, there's not going to be as many people subject to alternative minimum tax. Corporate did repeal that no, no corporate business will be subject to alternative minimum and tax. how do you know if you're no longer subject to it without I, calling your advisor? Is there a way to figure it out in your head? It's, it's really hard, and that's why we're here. I'll be honest with you. You add back state taxes. There's exemptions that I mentioned that have been increased going forward. But there's no, hey, I make a million bucks, I'm an AMT. That's the acronym for it. But it's really a calculation. It's very frustrating a lot of times for, with clients. Why am I in AMT? And it's, you know, normally those state taxes, when added back, you know, those are deducted for regular tax purposes. They're not for AMT. Now, I, I, I didn't bring you here for a political conversation, so I won't draw you into that. Um, but it seems to me that the smile on your face and just kind of the excitement, you know, you're, there are computer geeks, there are sports geeks, there are, they're a numbers geek. You're a numbers geek, right? So this this jacks you up a little bit, doesn't it? This, yeah. This, I mean, and I say that with respect. It's almost though, as I, as you're talking to me about some of these things, I think you, at the high level that you perform for your clients, both personal and business, and everybody else in your field, is almost kind of like, all right, let me roll up my sleeves because I really don't know what's going on here. I get the rules, but let me see how they really apply them. It's almost as if you're. I don't know, doing exploratory surgery on a patient, right? <laughs> is it like that for you? It is, and the thing that makes it more exciting or frustrating, depending on who you are, is it's changed so much over the last month. I've, I've done this conversation in different areas. Oh, so you've times. had different scenarios? Different scenarios, but you know, the House bill, the Senate bill, and then ultimately what came out. And I think they were doing a little bit of surgery too, is to see who does this really benefit? And, and when you look at where it started and where it ended up, right. there were some very big changes that you know, the top tax bracket came down, but not as much as originally. Let me ask, let me ask you this. I know I'm sure on time, and you've been terrific. We'll have you back because there's going to be a lot more questions. For those who are going to get adjusted in February, right, so the, the, the actual withholdings are going to, every, the, politically, they want the IRS to jump into this sucker real quick, and so the net pay for somebody with no increase in their gross pay is going to increase because the taxes will be less. Uh, is it smart for people to say, wait a second, I don't need that money quite yet because they're going to get hit on the back end in April of 19? Or should they just take the money and run when it comes to withholding? That's an interesting question. Uh, Everyone's specific Yeah, it really income. is. It's very specific to each individual. I, I'm not sure if that's going to be a mandate or not. Normally, the whole thought behind that is we're going to try to withhold at a oh, level make that's reasonable. It just so you know you don't come to next april and have no cash left because you had no withholdings against it mm -hmm. but i do think that's going to be one that's needs a little bit more clarification uh, at the end of night at the end of 18 uh come april 19 i only got 10 seconds are people gonna be happier or not i hope so i think it's a, a, an opportunity for everybody to look at what they have been doing talk to their advisors and uh, hopefully we can put more money in their pockets that's the intention behind this all right merry christmas Merry Christmas. Try to get it in. I know you got a lot of work to do. Santa's got his own work to do. Happy New Year, too. Thank you. Yeah, have fun. Final word next. And then there's the millennials and how they get their financial mm together. That's the name of the book. And we'll have some young fiscal advice tomorrow night. See you on the radio at 3 on WPRO as well. Good night.